Good day, everyone, and welcome to this webinar, Develop Lasting Relationships, Strategies to Better Communicate with Your Clients. And thank you for joining. My name is Marie Muldowney, and I'm the Managing Director of the Canadian Securities Institute. I'll take a moment to introduce this webinar, but first of all, let me take, through, take you through a few housekeeping items. First note that any information provided in this webinar represents statements of opinion and not statements of, re of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities or to provide legal or tax advice. We ask that no one record this webinar without Moody's explicit written permission. And lastly, no one has permission to quote any of the comments made by the by, made or questions made by the um, webinar audience. All members of the audience are currently on mute. If you have a question, and we do encourage questions, please type it in the question box, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So let's turn to the webinar. Well, CSI offers courses, certificates, and designations to financial services professionals. And clearly we want to ensure that you have knowledge to competently provide advice to your clients. That said, technical knowledge is not sufficient. Communications with your clients, how you, how you receive your client, how you communicate your understanding of your client's needs, how you communicate when there are family dynam dynamics, and how you present your recommendations are really part of your communication art, and they're much more than just the technical skills. So today we're going to focus on communication strategies that are useful in a client setting but also equally important when dealing with colleagues around you on whom you rely to do your work. So it is my pleasure to introduce the host for this session, John Pappas. John leads our business development team at CSI. Prior to joining CSI, John worked in various capacities in the financial services industry. For 20 years as an economist, an investment advisor, account executive, and market trader. So John will be mark moderating the, set, the panel and handling the questions from our audience. So let me turn the session over to John. Thank you, Marie. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here to moderate today's session. Good morning and good afternoon to all the participants joining today. And at a stretch, good evening if you happen to be on another continent. The topic for the session today, as Marie mentioned, is developing lasting relationships as it pertains to your business with strategies to better communicate with your clients. The format for today will be a question and answer session where each panelist will be asked a specific question centered around the theme. Each panelist will respond to the question sharing their own experience and expertise as it pertains both to their own clients as well as general best practices. The session will last for approximately one hour with each panelist having about 10 minutes to present their response. There will be a 10 minute Q and A session at the end of the panelist questions to allow all of you uh, to ask additional questions. Please feel free throughout the session to type in your questions in the question box. You can access the question box via the button at the bottom center of your screen. We will do our best to respond to as many as possible in the time allotted. We will also save the last five minutes for some closing comments. With that, I'd like to introduce our guest panelists for today. From the center of your screen, moving to the right, we have Leslie Baker, who is Senior Manager of Strategic Communications at RBC Wealth Management. We have Neela White, Senior Portfolio Manager with Raymond James and Michael Tarantino, Vice President and Wealth Consultant with RBC Wealth Management. Welcome to all of you. Let's move to the first question for Leslie. The way we communicate continues to evolve, which is changing the way we approach client relationships. Clients are seemingly coming into relationships with far more knowledge than they did 20 years ago. Leslie, in your view, how do you think this impacts financial services professionals and why is it an important factor to address? Well, thank you first off, John, for having me on the panel today. I can't tell you what an honor it is. Um, thank you for moderating today and uh, a huge shout out to the Canadian Securities Institute team that set us up for success today. I really have to say it's been an impressive experience. 
Um, I, I'm also honored to be on the panel with, with uh, Neela and Michael. And thank you to the participants as well, or the attendees today. I think this is very exciting. I know we had very high registration for this. And it's, uh, I think, a good starting point uh, to consider you know, some of the evolution of communications over the last, uh, we've got 20 years in there. I have to admit, I'm probably looking at about 30 years in the industry now. And the evolution that we have seen over that period of time in this industry has just been remarkable. And I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to have a, a front row seat to that and to have participated and benefited from it over my 30 year career. And when I when I cast my mind back, John, to where we were 30 years ago, I mean, imagine the early 90s. It's so fascinating to consider how we engaged with clients, what we thought of as our responsibility to the general public as uh, financial services advisors and, and, and people that really were in the business to elevate the experience of the general pub uh, public, but certainly our clients. And when I reflect back on it, I think, you know, where I started, I remember within the first few weeks of joining the industry, seeing a poll uh, that showed what was then not the investment advisor or financial advisor role, but was something we we rarely hear about, <clears throat> pardon me, anymore in this industry, and that is the broker role. And the unfortunate part was when you looked at the level of trust, <clears throat> pardon me, that was applied to a number of different professions, I have to say we did not fare well on that front. And we were, thankfully, thankfully they were on the list, we only beat out used car salesmen in terms of the credibility that we had in this industry. And if you want a, a great reference point to understand where we were back then and how we engaged with clients, I strongly recommend watching the movie Wall Street. A wonderful movie uh, about this industry where we've been uh, and, and really how we approached uh, our engagements with clients and, and how we thought of ourselves in this industry. Largely what was happening in the early part of the 90s uh, as we progressed through that period of time was something I call uh, really being driven by PPC and that's performance, product, and, and really comprehension. And I'll come to that in a moment, what I mean by that, but at the, the focus of the industry and how we engage clients uh, was really around performance, placing product with them, uh, chasing returns, talking about hot stock picks. We used to talk about, you know, stock pickers and, and, and stock jockeys. This industry, uh, John, I would say has gone through not only a massive evolution, but in fact, a revolution and an entire 180 uh, perspective change over time that has led to two very, very important things within that paradigm of shifting from a advisor-centric, uh, uh, company-centric, and industry-centric view to really being client-centric. And I think the one of the, the biggest developments around that as we progressed through the 1990s, which I certainly benefited in my career, was that key uh, service providers and advice providers began to really recognize that they had to elevate the level of engagement uh, with clients in order to really build meaningful relationships over time and to actually add meaningful value to the client experience. And a big part of what's changed over the last 30 years and really started to accelerate through the 1990s, and by the way, the Canadian Securities Institute has been a huge part of this. Uh, I would say the, the Financial Planning Society, the, the CFA Society, all of these wonderful educators who, along with legislators and regulators, have really focused in on professionalizing this industry. I think what we've seen is the level of education skyrocket over that period of time. And we've really cleaned up the industry, I think, to get rid of a lot of people who we might term as charlatans and people who had no place providing advice to clients and guidance to clients. And we've gradually really professionalized the industry. And I think that's been a hugely important development over the last 20 or 30 years. And then on top of that, what we've seen is something I'd like to refer to as really the democratization of access to wealth management services and expertise. And this was generally the purview 
of only the very wealthiest when I entered this industry. And nowadays, we consider this to be something that we, we strive to provide access to every level of client across uh, the spectrum of clients and the, the spectrum of wealth. And so I think we've come so far in that way. And I'll, I'll tie this into how that's changed communications, but it's very exciting that that's the case. That professionalization and I think that access to products and services and expertise, which also includes, by the way, access to products and services in areas of the market that we couldn't have even imagined 30 years ago. I remember, John, when I came into the industry, uh, hedge funds were a mystery. Um, you know, the idea that clients would have access to alternative investments, that clients would have access to very uh, specific types of alternative investments, including private equity. These are things now that we are starting to almost take for granted that we will continue to progress in this way and evolve to engage clients and to ensure that really we're switching over to worrying about what, what's important to them and really being seeing ourselves as being problem solvers and, and really focusing on what matters to them. And again, that 180 shift from what mattered to us uh, and, and what we wanted to teach clients about. And that's the, the part about comprehension. Uh, I think now where we've, we've really changed the focus uh, as advisors and even as investment firms that are putting out information to the general pop, uh, pub, uh, uh, population out there, that you know what our thoughts are, are about what matters to the client and what is going to make uh, their journey to achieving their goals as smooth as possible and as clear as possible for them to achieve what matters to them. And I think we've, we've clearly uh, evolved the way we engage clients. So what used to be when I started in this industry so much more about you know, what we thought about things and we thought you needed to know as a client needed to get educated about, instead of, of thinking about comprehension, which is an important part of what we do, We've come to realize that that's something that the client elects to do as to the level of, of comprehension they want to achieve. However, what's important in what's changed in the industry over time, as we've shed that, that broker idea and we've really become advisors and trusted advisors to our clients, we've shifted the entire focus of communications to be about what matters to the client, but also less about trying to drive comprehension as it is about driving understanding and connection with clients. So whether you're engaging in a mass marketing campaign uh, on Facebook, whether or not you're, you're, you're talking about sitting down face to face with a client uh, to discuss their portfolio and their financial plan, we've elevated through education, through professionalization, through democratization of access to expertise, products and services, we can really focus now and we've really focused ourselves in on that client interaction, building trust with clients because we're directing our efforts to what matters to them. And too long in this industry, we, we, we really talked too much about what was important to us. We talked about, you know, our expertise, look at us, our expertise in portfolio management. But now we look at things very differently. So when we communicate with clients, we're talking in their language, not ours, ideally. And really what we're trying to do in this circumstance is understand what's important to them, take that with our expertise and turn that into something that makes sense to us, of course. So if we're talking about worrying about outliving your money, John, in this day, and, you know, as Canadians live longer, uh, that's not really a portfolio discussion with the client. That's addressing their concerns about how they're aging and how they wish to age and what that means in terms of engaging them around those topics. That actually ends up being more about estate planning and about understanding you know, whether or not you are protected as it relates to things like powers of attorney. It's not necessarily about how we're managing the portfolio, but that comes into it as well. So it's really mixing up how we think about uh, engaging with clients, ensuring that our clients understand and appreciate that we in turn get what's important to them. That's changed the entire conversation. And I would just finish by saying, I think I have maybe about uh, a minute left here. Uh, when it comes to social media and the internet, 
to your point earlier, this has really raised the expectations of clients. They can get basic information. They can get so many different options and they can get a tremendous amount of information. But communications and effective communications is not about information. It's about breaking through. It's about reaching understanding with clients and uh, in turn for advisors and their firms, understanding what's important to clients and translating that into what matters to them in a language they can understand and appreciate. And I think when you're talking about social media, that that's a tricky thing uh, in this day and age. Maybe we'll come back to that in a little while. But when it comes to communications through that particular medium, really knowing your audience, understanding what it is that you're trying to communicate and what's important to that audience period. So at this point, I, I see I'm, uh, I'm, I've run out of time. I'll pass it back to you, John. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that response, Leslie. I, I, I do have one small additional question to ask, and it's, it's really yes. around uh, your first slide here that you showed of uh, shifting from uh, uh, rates of return, if you will, or portfolio yes. performance to better understanding the customer. Um, yeah. can you just walk us through very, very quickly what that actually means in reality? So I'm assuming that when you meet somebody for the first time that you're actually spending, uh, a considerable amount of time, uh, understanding what that client is currently doing and where they want to go before you even sit down to consider what might a portfolio makeup look like. Right. Absolutely. John. Yeah, that's that's what I would consider to be the discovery phase, if you will, uh, with the client. And I know that Neil is going to speak to some of this, and Michael as well. Um, but I I think as you're as you're engaging a client, it's really about you doing less talking, if any talking at all, and really allowing the client to speak, really allowing the customer to speak, and and uh, depending upon how you term that. And it it's so critical that we're listeners not so much educators or talkers. And I think that was the old style that we really sat in the, in a, in, on the other side of the desk and we were educated. We're bringing you up to what we think uh, your level of, of knowledge. That was what I was talking about in terms of focusing on comprehension versus understanding. Mm -hmm. And how this comes into play, John, is, is that, as I mentioned before, if somebody's concerned about you know their parents, their aging parents, this is a real concern now in this day and age. And previously, we really thought about, well, we're just going to get you to retirement and get and build up your, your uh, pot of gold to be big enough that it's going to carry you through your retirement. And we often thought strictly in terms of getting you to your investment time horizon being, you know, till you were 60 or 65. Now we appreciate that people are living much longer. They're being challenged in terms of health and, and, and what's happening with their kids as they're aging, what's happening to their parents as they're aging. We call that, you know, sort of that sandwich generation. It's it, it, the whole dialogue shifts when you think about it through the lens of the client rather than our lens. So what that means is we have to be as professionals, we have to take that away and realize that we need to build a portfolio for a client who's concerned about, for, for instance, outliving their money. We need to think about their time horizon no longer as 60 or 65, but as 100. You know, we have to start thinking about how what that means over time and preserving wealth, building wealth at the same time, creating income. Those are things that that's our problem solving. And rather than that being the problem of the client, we're here to try to solve that problem. But we're also explaining what we understand is the conversation around wealth. And I know at RBC Wealth Management Canada, we're really thinking at an elevated level beyond financial planning, beyond investment planning to really understanding wealth, the real wealth of the client. And that's their health and well-being. You know, that's that's far more than just the size of their portfolio or necessarily, you know, what kind of uh, uh, financial plan we put together for them. So again, we talk about things like legacy. What do we want our client's legacy to be? Or what do they want their legacy to be? And how can we help them in terms of charitable giving, as you see there? If they're concerned about you know, the, the efficacy of their financial plan, we need to think about tax planning and tax strategies. If they're worried about risk, we need to think about insurance and how do we protect them in the event of, of an early passing or as it may relate to their business. Business succession is huge. You know, All of these particular areas, and of course, 
what used to be the third rail of conversations, estate planning. And this is where, you know, this is so important. Again, as I mentioned before, as we think about aging parents and aging in place, and how do we continue to create opportunities for our clients to live the life they want to, to achieve the goals that they want to, how we take that and we make that a reality for them really speaks to our expertise. But again, from a communication standpoint, we need to translate that into the things that matter for clients. Does that help? Indeed. Indeed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very detailed response. <laughs> uh, my next question is directed to Neela. Conversations now begin in many ways across a variety of mediums. Neela, what are some of the methods financial services professionals may use to enhance the way they communicate with their clients? Well, Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. And Leslie, that was a uh, fantastic, uh, important points. And I certainly agree that the uh, there has been an evolution of communication within our industry. And I think that is part and parcel of the various forms of communication that we can use. You know, it used to be face to face meetings and telephoning clients. You know, then we drifted into emails as well as a third form. And then, you know, later on, we ended up having uh, cell phones where we could respond right at the moment and expect a response to come back. And now we're into, um, you know, using emojis, using bitmojis, using emocon. So they're all different ways of communicating. And I think part of what we as advisors, or we as, as professionals, period, we need to also figure out who our audience is, who is that type of conversation and communication appropriate with. So I think when I look at communication, I, I would go back to, I read an interesting study and it was from the University of California, Berkeley. And it said that through a variety of methods, so verbal af affirmations, like me saying mm -hmm, and stuff like that, my attention, my making eye contact, whatever my face is saying to you, my voice and my tone, how I'm holding my body, that within 20 seconds, somebody makes a decision as to whether we're trustworthy or not. And I think that really makes it quite imperative that we realize that um, what we say, the conveyance of uh, information, of ideas, and of feelings, that it's being shared both through words and through nonverbal cues, body language. And it's always very important that whoever our audience is, they may not remember what we say, but they'll remember how we made them feel. And an interesting point about that is within the spectrum of communication, body language and entire is about 55% of our communication, of our understanding. About 38% is conveyed through our tone of voice. 7% is words. So words alone are not communication. And I think one of the, um, single biggest problems maybe with communication ends up being that we could be having a conversation with someone and they're doing all the appropriate things they're nodding mm -hmm, yes mm -hmm. and meanwhile they are providing us the cues that they expect us to see and they have no idea um, what our intent is what our meeting is what we wanted to get across because part of what we don't know is when they're sitting with us um, you know across the table aside from us or through a screen, we don't know what their day started like and we don't know what's already in their mind. So there are many more things than just having a conversation um, with a client to ascertain, are they really hearing what we're saying? And do we really hear and understand what they mean in response? And I think uh, Leslie touched on a, a very good point way back in the industry, decades and decades ago, so 25 years ago for me, um, you know, it used to be, you know, line item, one item conversations, and it was all about the balance sheet and how your stock's doing with very little uh, conversation on who and what you are and get to get a real understanding of you as the person. And I think part of it also was well is this, the expectation back then that if you were a, um, not even an investment advisor, if you were a stockbroker, it's an information push. And then you take it at your own time, your own pace, you go through it and you would call us if you had any questions. Whereas now it's really, this is a means to get to this. And I think that that's where the broader understanding of the points of communication have to come from. So I think when we think about communication itself as well, 
is all of us are very good at responding. All of us are very good at talking and it takes active practice to listen. So what is active listening? Active listening means more than just talking. So when we're talking to a client, when a client's talking to us, I think it's super important that we show concern and empathy. And it's really just, you know, simple statements like, can you tell me more about that? Can you describe what that means? Can you give me an example? You know, is there anything else that you'd like to add that really shows that there's um, an engagement in the conversation because you're prompting them to tell you more. And uh, an important thing when we are having conversations with clients is silence or little gaps of, of no one saying anything tends to make people very uncomfortable and, and fidgety and you rush in to say something. And I think pauses are good when we're having conversations because it might actually force them to fill the void a bit with more detail or to get through that pause. It would be something to the effect of, you know, I, I really heard what you're saying. Can you give me an example of, of when you felt this way? And it might create um, a more in-depth, more detailed picture that the client is pacing about, sorry, a painting about themselves. I think it's really important also when we're actively listening to paraphrase and to show understanding. I think um, to rephrase and paraphrase what they have said to you shows that one, you're engaged in the conversation. Two, you heard what they said. Three, it gives the ability, if you paraphrase and paraphrasing correctly, to show that you misheard or misunderstood what they said because maybe it had two meanings. You took it um, from a point of your emotion, whereas the client said it from a point of their emotion. Um, so I think it quickly identifies, are we on the right path to understanding who our client is and what's important to them and what their value is? Um, I think using the words like so, so, you know, if I hear you correctly, so if I understand where you're coming from, I think that creates um, an involvement, a collaboration. And I think the more we are looked at as collaborative partners, I think the more we develop trust through the whole uh, aspect of active listening. Um, another important, uh, I think, thing, whether you're in person or whether you're doing something like this through Zoom, it would be at appropriate spots when a client is telling you a story, telling you about their family, is to not. It shows engagement, it doesn't interrupt the flow of the conversation, but it shows that you're still there. And definitely one of the big ones to earning trust and active listening is engagement, so eye engagement. So an example would be right now, I'm looking straight at the camera. This is me looking at my screen. I'm sure you guys can tell what I'm doing right now while you're telling me and talking to me and telling me something deep and meaningful. Immediately, I'm sure some of you may have had some response on how you felt when I immediately looked away from the camera and started engaging in what's around me and in my own head. And that's never good with a client. It'll create feelings of distrust and uncaring. Um, another one is leaning, leaning into the conversation, especially when you're in person. It shows that you're engaged in the conversation. It shows that you want to hear more. You're interested. Um, you have a greater understanding. And that there's a proximity that's slowly, slowly being reduced, which creates a bit of intimacy that this is somebody who is in my corner, this is my person. So I think it's uh, uh, very important to give people the ability to say what they're saying, as well as it allows them to speak longer. So you'll notice sometimes that when somebody's speaking and you're doing um, sort of just simple little phrases, mm -hmm. tell me more, wow. Mm -hmm little prompts. It shows them, okay, I can continue. I can continue. I don't have a glazed look on my face. And it's giving them permission to continue if they feel comfortable continuing. I think also um, verbal affirmations, that's one of the things that, you know, let's say there is a little bit of a pause. I think it's important to say, you know, is there anything else you'd like to tell me? You, you've painted a really great picture. I have a better understanding. Is there anything else is there anything that I've missed? And I think one of the big aspects of communication as well would be 
um, definitely don't pass judgment. Um, it's very easy, I think, for all of us to form opinions and come from our point of reference. And we all know what something like that looks like. And those are also a bit of social cues, right? You know, the or rolling of the eyes. So all of these impressions, and sometimes they tend to be rather instinctive than conscious. And if they're instinctive, you may not even be aware that you are giving signs that you're not engaged in the conversation, um, that you find everything very dull. And I think when we look at something um, like that, when we're trying to engage the client, when we're trying to build a moat around the client and to be that number one person that they go to, everything you do has to indicate that you care. And that is all, whether it's verbal communication or whether it is nonverbal communication. And I think lastly, um, when I look at social cues, so all of us have been, uh, um, have encountered people who we feel lack social awareness or they don't understand social cues. So again, a big one is how do you use your face when you're having uh, a conversation? Do you smile? Smiling at someone certainly puts them more at ease than when you're scowling. When you scowl at someone, it automatically sets up a defense you know, along with uh, facial cues would be the crossing of the arms. It sets up a block. It uh, decreases the ability to be intimate or to divulge, divulge sorry, um, emotional or personal information, which helps you in the whole managing of their situation. Um, I think it's important that sometimes if we're not aware that we're doing this, maybe we just practice with a colleague. Um, if we have a client that we know that's coming in who's a little bit more sensitive or a little bit more reactionary, especially now with uh, 2022 and, and what's been recently happening in the market, that maybe it is an idea to, you know, have your assistant or have a colleague sit with you and practice and let them tell you, what do I see on your face? If I were a client and I didn't know you, this is what I'd see on your face. I think it's a good um, reminder that we all have habits and ticks that we're not aware of and we're not as conscious of as we should be. And I think also just sort of during the pandemic, we sort of maybe became a little bit lax in how we communicated with people. Um, as we know, body language is 55% of everything that we uh, imbue to a client as far as what they feel and what they're willing to say to us. So I think it's, um, we need to be conscious of how we represent ourselves. And it's, you know, again, it's certain things like, when we're having a conversation with the client, you know, if they're saying something where they're possibly looking for us to agree or to not or validate what they're saying, but we're doing this right there, that gives them um, cross signals. It sets up a discord with a client. Or, you know, if we're doing things like we're saying something to our client, you know, uh, Mrs. Jones, I, I really understand what you're saying. You know, they, they have to now make a judgment call on do they think I'm honest? Do they think I care? Do I think, uh, do they think th that I have their best interest at heart? So I think we need to practice mirroring our client. And I don't mean the way that we've seen it on comedy movies and stuff like that. They move forward, we move forward, they take a drink, we uh, take a drink to the point that now we've made them very uncomfortable and they're wondering what's wrong with us. But I think it has to be subtle, uh, a subtle mirroring. You know, they're nodding, we nod, they move a little bit forward, we wait a second. You know, maybe we sit a little bit closer, we're more attentive, we sit up. So it's mirroring their gestures, it's mirroring their tone, it's mirroring also their pace of conversation. So let's say, you know, they're speaking at a slower rate, maybe we slow down what our natural speech would be so that we're matching their pace. The more in sync we can get with what they're exuding is the more trust that's going to be built within the relationship. Um, I think also we have to be conscious of the amount of space we use. I mean, I'm sure all of us have had meetings before where we're sitting at a boardroom table or our own desk, you know, and there's, there's the client's portfolio, the stuff we want to discuss, everything's spread out. So we're taking up a lot of space. It doesn't leave the client a lot of space to be relaxed as opposed to the client might just sit there. They're going to compensate from your overuse of space. So I think we need to be conscious of that. And I think 
you know, when we think about tone, I think tone is two things now, you know, it used to be your voice has a tone, your voice has a mood, which we all can hear, you know, there, there are some intuitive wiring that where we can tell is somebody mad, somebody excited, someone happy, someone sad. I think what we also need to be careful of in communication, whether we're sending uh, emails to our clients, whether we're receiving emails from our clients, that we don't assign a negative emotion to a brief message, to a one word message, or to a whole conversation. It's a form of communication in its basic form of just responding or just making a statement. And I think it's too easy to take a look at an email or a text, and it's not the response you want, and you apply emotion to it and become reactionary. So I'm not sure how many of you have had this, but I know for me, um, I will tend to maybe send my husband uh, wordy or lengthy texts, which are like little mini stories, and then I might get the letter K back. I was like, what? I spent all of this time sending a text and I got, okay, spend the rest of the day pumping myself up, walk through that door. Is that the best you can do? Neela, you didn't ask a question and you were telling me a story. So I think it's it's important not to assign emotion. And if we do want to assign emotion to something so that we know that the client is going to receive it in the way that we meant it, you know, there's the whole development now of um, emojis, as I'd mentioned, emocons, bitmojis, and that's to fill the void in communication. So because communication itself was becoming flat, it was words, there was a gap and that was the human experience. And what developed in, I think it was the early 2000s, were the emojis and emo emocons so that when you're um, saying something, you can send an, something that's expressive to give the idea of what emotion you're at and or what intent that this was sent with. Um, so I think, you know, when we look at communication sort of more modernly, emojis have become the new social cue, um, especially for younger generations. And I think it's just one of those things of we need to adapt to all forms of communication. If we can't use them well, maybe it's something that we should stay away from. And I, I would like to just end by reiterating, um, in my experience, um, because I, I've dealt with a lot of, uh, actually, uh, Leslie, to your point, to a lot of uh, aging and end of life conversations, it's not really the words that we ever say to somebody that they will ever remember. It'll be, did they leave the conversation feeling at peace, comforted, confident, like they have somebody batting for them? So I think we need to work on how do we make people feel? Thank you, John. Thank you, Neela. Uh, some some excellent ideas in uh, everything that you put forth here. Um, you touched on it very briefly, but I will I will just sort of add uh, one word to your slide here: uh, pacing. I, okay. I think you're an excellent excellent example of how to pace your speech leaving room for thought and 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 response um i think that it's very it's a very important aspect to communicating is how quickly you say what you say or how slowly you say what you mm -hmm. say i have found in general that most people tend to listen more um to another person when they're speaking a little bit slower mm -hmm. uh it's a little bit more deliberate but it's uh um it has yeah high utility. So thank you for that. Okay. Uh, we'll move along here. Finally, uh, I would like to call on Michael uh, for the next question. Uh, before I uh, put that forth, uh, I just want to remind the participants that there is a Q&A box at the bottom center of your screen if you wish to ask any questions as we will get to the Q&A session in about about 10 minutes or so. So feel free to to ask any additional questions that maybe aren't uh, immediately responded to uh, from the panels. Uh, financial services professionals work with a varied audience addressing numerous subjects that may have varied levels of complexity. Michael, how might an advisor tailor their approach based on the unique requirements of the client? Well, 
Thank you, John, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here on, on the panel. Uh, I think we've had a, a great uh, entry point uh, with uh, Leslie and, and Neela already uh, articulating some of the importance of how to communicate, uh, how to address, and some of the topic areas. And so uh, I, I know that uh, as I kind of go through this, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to encapsulate uh, some of the conversations that have previously been discussed. I think it's important to note that uh, as we look at this uh, conversation of addressing clients, um, you know, the way I would frame it is that uh, it quality of advice uh, is not necessarily indicative of the complexity or the size of the client. Uh, it's really making sure that you're being specific to that specific client's goals and objectives and providing them the advice that is appropriate to them. Uh, the way in which I've conducted myself over the 25 years is a little unique uh, in that uh, I had 25 years of experience in being a goals-based planner. And so I've seen the evolution of goals-based planning uh, from product-specific goals-based uh, conversations. So in the late 90s, uh, I was actually using a telephone uh, prospecting clients and cold calling them to have goals-based conversations around their retirement. And it was really just doing a simplified goals-based illustration of here's where you are today. Here's how much cash you need to spend, uh, you know, when you retire at age 65. So here's what you're going to need to save in order to consume this kind of money based on a rudimentary rate of return and a rudimentary rate of inflation. So that was goals-based planning in the late 90s. So uh, to Leslie's point, you can see, and to Neela's point, you can see how the evolution of the conversations evolved from single goal to multi-goal, to varying degrees of complexity. And so while in that particular circumstance, I learned the importance of having uh, meaningful conversations with individuals around $5,000 contributions to an RSP, I've been on the other end of the spectrum where I've had similar types of goals-based conversations with very, very affluent families across Canada. And it's no different. You're really there trying to understand what resonates and what's important to them. And it's all about as Neela said, it's active listening. It's making sure that you're aware, you're there, and being there and responsible in the conversation. Uh, and there's a piece of advice I can give to investment advisors or planners. It's really having them identify what their unique value proposition is. And so I'm not the first one to talk about that unique value proposition. I've uh, been a student of understanding uh, the unique value proposition and read several books on how to define and how to position yourself but I think if everyone out there can take an opportunity to just think about who they are, what they do and how they do it uh, and what uniqueness they bring into the client conversation, that's going to be critically important because everyone has a role to play. Uh, Leslie put up that wheel that talks about estate planning, tax planning. Um, you know, everyone has a unique specialty. Uh, not everyone is an advanced financial planner. Not everyone is uh, a tax practitioner. Not everyone is an estate planning practitioner. So it's looking within their network and saying, who do I have uh, that I can leverage uh, for some of the capabilities in providing this type of advice and guidance? In some cases, it may be even just looking at their existing network as in terms of family and friends. Are these people that I can practice some of my capabilities on and just being that sounding board in terms of how I conduct myself? You know, I think uh, Neela hit it right on the head when she talked about practice, even just with a colleague in, in, in the office. And, uh, I think many of us probably grew up in shadowing and role playing when we first started 25 years ago because it was relatively new. The great thing now is it's it's not new anymore. We're 25 years into having these robust types of conversations. So the practitioners, you know, have a little gray hair. Uh, you know, they have a little bit of experience, uh, and they can provide you with a lot of valuable insights in terms of how to change maybe your approach and how to change maybe your process how to highlight some of your uniqueness or some of that, uh, you know, unique capabilities that you have. Um, for myself, when I was an advisor, I actually built out a, a practice where I managed client relationships. And, and part of the uniqueness that I brought to the table is I had language capabilities. And so I did deal with a lot of uh, Italians in, in a very, very uh, Italian centric community. And that's how I built out my practice, really just leveraging my heritage and my capabilities was the way in which I really put my area of focus out there. And then I started adding in my advanced capabilities around planning, around complex credit, around business owners, around tax. And so if, if individuals start harnessing their own ways in which they want to run their business, I think they're going to understand 
their uniqueness is the way in which they'll resonate with the client, but always stay client focused, always focus on understanding who the client, where the client is, where they want to be, what's important to them. Uh, you know, it's always, uh, you know, for us, we look at the first point of contact to say, oh, they've got investments, but really it's not investments because the reality is there are unique circumstances. It could be the fine family dynamics. It could be uh, a complex ownership structure. It could be some of the estate planning issues that need to be resolved for them. Investments may become a secondary component once you resolve the goals and the objectives of clients. And that comes into, are you listening and are you hearing me? Because uh, the last thing uh, a new relationship person wants to see is that you're there focused on one component uh, of the objective. Uh, and it may just be that product sleeve. And they're going to view you as a product sleeve. And so you live and die by performance versus, you know, you become that relationship person. And so if you're becoming a relationship person, they're going to call Neela when they have anything that arises. Uh, you know, lead, Neela's just mentioned how she talked to clients at time of crisis when somebody passes away and she's there actively listening. If you become that person uh, that's there for them when they need you and not just for performance driven results, uh, you'll have longer term relationships, longer term outcomes and better value of advice, but you'll, you'll move yourself up this pendulum in terms of where you sit in the hierarchy of uh, importance for advice or considerations uh, for anything that's important to them in the family. We're not all experts. Uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to uh, build out, uh, an, uh, you know, and work with a, a very specialized group of individuals. And I've come to RBC to work in another very specialized group of uh, individuals. And the one thing I can say is, you know, focus on leveraging the capability of uh, individuals that have expertise either within the industry or within the confines of your company. Uh, you'll be amazed on how many resources are available or willing to work with you. Um, the benefit of leveraging these team-based uh, approach is that you do have to just fill in where, you, where, where you're, you're best appropriate. The other thing about understanding the capabilities of team is you may find yourself where you're in front of a client that's very, very complex. And so they trust you and you are that person that's actively listened. And so they do want to work with you. And the reason why I know this is because I've had the opportunity of working and training advisors at various ages and, and various groups. And, and one of my experiences where I learned early on was an advisor that was 27 years old and relatively new into the industry. And he came with a very, very complex client that was in the hundreds of million dollars worth uh, net worth. And the reason why he had this individual is because he sat on a charitable board uh, with this very senior individual. And he created a long-term relationship over three years before he entered the industry. And he became a confidant uh, to this founder and significantly wealthy family member. And this 27 year old came to me and said, Michael, here's the family, here's the unique circumstances. Is there something we can do to help? And of course there are, are ways in which we can help facilitate uh, by actively listening and, and going through a goals-based approach uh, and bringing in the right type of people uh, to educate that client. But there's an opportunity where it could have easily been, here's a 27 year old, do we dismiss him and say, he's relatively new to the industry. He may or may not have the capability or the means to put this client in front of this team. Or do we listen to this advisor or, and listen to the client's goals and objectives and see if there's an opportunity where we can help facilitate. And so I think there's an opportunity where people can kind of step back and they themselves can see if there's opportunities either within the companies that they work for or the industry uh, to partner. From a technology perspective, I think, you know, from a communication perspective, there's different ways in which, uh, you know, people are, are, are presenting themselves. Uh, the one thing I can say from technology is the evolution even from myself. Uh, you know, I was um, doing goals-based planning in uh, 1997, and it was by calling clients. They never saw my face. I was calling them to do, uh, understand their goals and their objectives. I would punch it into a computer. I would mail them their goals-based plan. Then we would have a conversation around the goals-based plan. If they liked it, we'd mail them an account agreement to open up a mutual fund, and we'd invest it into a wrap account. So. You can see how that's evolved from 1997 to 2023, where we're doing webinars, WebExes, in-person meetings, 
Um, you know, it, the evolution is, is changes. It's so dynamic. Uh, you know, you've got social media, you've got webinars, you've got LinkedIn. Uh, I would say leverage and, and embrace technology. Um, you know, everyone's using it in a different fashion. Uh, and I would say it's, it's a useful median, but it doesn't necessarily, it's never going to necessarily replace the human element, which is uh, the advice in which the advisor is going to give a client. And did they tailor it specifically to that client's unique circumstance? If we can go to the, the next slide. Uh, this one is really more just for individuals to think about how they actually going to position themselves, right? And, and so part of positioning is really how do I conduct myself as a professional practice, right? I'm Michael Tarantino. I could be Michael Tarantino Inc. I work for RBC Wealth Management, but at the same time, I have to go out there and be able to articulate uh, and present myself and promote myself because if I'm going out to prospect net new clients, it's either internal, external, or abroad. And part of the promotion is making sure that my brand is something that's going to attract clients to come in to meet me. But once I've been able to articulate who I am, what I do, and how I do it, I have to be able to have a way in which I'm going to address them. And that's, you know, looking at the process in which I'm going to do it. So the last thing I want to do is re-replicate the way in which I'm going to go about running my meetings. I also don't want to have a net new way in which I'm going to engage one client. So if I'm managing a book of, let's say 50 households and client number 51 shows up and says, Michael, I want you to do X, Y, Z for me. And this is how I want you to do it. If it doesn't necessarily fit into the way in which I can do it for my other 50 clients, uh, and it's not, and it's not going to disrupt my other 50 clients, then I may take them on. But if it's very, very unique and it's going to be time consuming, it's going to be at the detriment of my other 50 clients. I'm not going to be able to do uh, the meetings the way in which I've done it. I'm not going to be able to listen to them actively. I may have to re revisit whether or not that's even something that fits into the parameters that I can deliver. And that becomes part of the people, right? And it becomes, is it a client that I do or do not want to work with? It does it, that client fit into the people that I have access to within my network to support them? Can we accommodate uh, and, and can we all work together? Um, because the last thing you want to do is be disruptive in terms of your model, uh, in terms of how you're going to engage them and how you're going to introduce them to the exports of the individuals within the group, uh, specifically if it becomes a challenge in terms of delivering or executing to it. Products are unique. Uh, and, but yet they're open architecture in some cases. And so from that perspective, I think advisors need to know the product shelf that they are capable of advising to, comfortable in advising to, but recognize that there's also experts with product capabilities that help satisfy specific client goals and objectives. And that may be even when it becomes a complex business owner with advanced tax planning and estate planning needs where you're looking at executive type of services or life insurance. If you recognize the goals and objectives, then you're recognizing in your process who the people are that are gonna align those products and services back to the goals and the objectives of that client. In some cases, advisors have the opportunity to dictate their price. Uh, and so they'll engage in, a, uh, in, a, in an agreement or conversation with clients in terms of their value and the uniqueness and why they can charge X amount of dollars for managing client relationships. And in some cases it's embedded within your fee structure, dependent on the value you're going to de deliver. I would say if you've engaged them in the right type of process with the right type of conversation with the right type of people and the right type of solutions, price is somewhat a mute point because they're going to see the value of who you are and how you've engaged them in a conversation. Uh, and it's going to be catered specifically to the outcomes that they're looking for. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to John. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, you've raised some very, very interesting points here. Um, we've provided uh, the panelists here with a significant amount of information. And uh, the goal is for all of you to take this away and synthesize everything that has been discussed today and, and apply the information to your own client relationships in business. Uh, at this point, we're about seven minutes uh, to the top of the hour. I think we have some time for a few questions, maybe do a bit of a speed round between the three of you. Um, 
if we can keep the responses brief, um, uh, they don't have to be one word answers, but uh, <laughs> if you can keep them brief, uh, that would be appreciated. So I'd like to pose this question uh, to the whole group and whoever wants to take it on. Uh, what are some of the ways you specifically leverage social media to build new connections? Feel free to jump in. <laughs> Dela, after you. You know what, I'll, I'll make mine quick. So um, I'm also an aging specialist. So what I do on social media, it's, it's mostly, um, I, I'm worried why you're, why you're laughing at that. Is it the gray? <laughs> Is that I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit and I've joined a lot of um, groups that cater to seniors that uh, are active in senior policy. So I think it's really uh, looking at your practice and looking at who you are and finding out what are you passionate about? What can you speak uh, confidently and with passion about and do searches on LinkedIn on those groups and join them. That way you further your vocabulary and touch points within that group so you have the conversation. Perfect. Anybody else uh, want to respond? I would. I would add, John, I, I mean, this is uh, table stakes now. You've got to be on social media. It is an amazing way of connecting with people. I think it's a double-edged sword. That's the only thing I would say. I, I really strongly recommend to any advisors out there, anyone who's planning on leveraging social media or is doing so today, have a strategy. Know what it is you, you want to do. Uh, you've got to have integrity around executing that strategy. If you say you're going to drop a podcast every Monday morning, you got to do it. Uh, it. It is both an amazing way to connect with people, but it can also create a gap between you and your perspective or existing clients. And so it's so useful. I mean, uh, Michael mentioned earlier about making phone calls back in the 90s. I mean, that's the way we did things. And if you needed to tell clients that there was a banking crisis going on, you needed to make 300 phone calls. Impossible to do. And of course, you know, when it comes in a newsletter in your in the client statement three months later, it's not really an issue anymore. So the, the, the immediacy of social media and the consistency of being able to contact and stay in touch and broaden your your audience is remarkably important but that's the thing know your audience we talk about know your client in this business know your audience when it comes to marketing communications you've got to know what you're talking about and you've got to do it in a way that respects your audience and if the client wants to engage to a greater extent we're back to comprehension they can do so you can offer them that but start at a level that respects them and make sure, again, you have a strategy and know what it is you want out of that engagement. Very good. Very good. I'll, I'll pose this, uh, I guess, second and maybe last question to Michael here. Uh, and it's an ancillary question to the one that I just asked. Um, because, uh, Leslie, you mentioned, you know, how, to, how do you communicate a banking crisis to your clients without having to make 300 phone calls? So this is a very interesting question in, the, in, in a similar sense. Are there any specific methods that work better than others when communicating to clients about critical updates to their financials or their account? I.e., you know, if there's a drawdown or, you know, anything could possibly happen. Is there any, any methodology that you find works better than others? I would, I would probably just reiterate actually what, what Leslie said there. Uh, I think it's important to, to recognize that, you know, if it's client specific, you know, you got to do it in a timely manner. So if it's a one-on-one, -on -one, one-off, and something specific is happening to that client, you you better get on the phone and have that conversation uh, and make sure that you're addressing uh, whatever, you know, ambiguity or, or challenge is happening in that account specific. But if it's, large scale, uh, something that's happening to the market, uh, you know, mass communication, getting that newsletter out immediately is going to be important. Uh, a lot of times there's also panel experts that are hosting calls. And if you can get a client based on a dedicated virtual call, uh, that's also probably going to be uh, critically important for individuals when it's market related, uh, more broadly, I would say. Makes sense. Makes sense. Thank you for that. So we're about two minutes to the top of the hour. I think at this point, I would like to take uh, a second and thank all the panelists and all the participants uh, joining from across the country uh, for your time and consideration in today's session. Uh, so thank you very much for that. 
Uh, it was a very informative session. I will pass it back to Marie for some closing comments at this point. Great, thank you, John. Thank you for uh, moderating the session. And thank you, Leslie, Neela, and Michael for recommending such rich and varied strategies for successful communications. And Neela, I will never answer with K. Got it. <laughs> so we hope that you found the webinar beneficial. Uh, solid communications must be built on a solid base of technical knowledge. And we build and offer courses leading to certifications that will help you advance your, your career. We provide practical knowledge that you can apply immediately in your role in the financial institutions. But all of that has to be built on communications. And while you have this solid foundation, complementary communication skills are really important. So as you can see from today's seminar, communication is very much about how you present yourself, your empathy, your engagement with your client, and how you make them feel. So, if you have any additional questions, please email designations at csi.ca. A replay of this event will be available in the coming days. And for information on upcoming webinars, please visit our website at csi.ca. So thank you for attending and have a great day.